Welcome to the final episode of this season's Contender Series. It is week 10, and we have been absolutely killing it, especially over the last half of this uh, season. I should have pulled this up before, but I just quickly wanted to touch on the performance that we had uh, thus far uh, through nine weeks of the Contender Series. We got plus 21.06 units and a 43% ROI. Uh, in terms of my best predictions, we went 33-11 and 11 so far with one week left. But the last five weeks have been absolutely crazy. I think I've only gotten one or two predictions wrong. Uh, and a lot of people have been cashing uh, happily. So shout out to everybody that's been jumping onto the Patreon page to support, uh, dropping a super thanks uh, through YouTube as well to show your appreciation. I greatly appreciate that. Um, and yeah, again, I, I do as much research as I possibly can to give you guys as much information about these fighters and then give you guys an educated prediction and maybe some bets to go along with it. And the best way I do that is actually through the MMA Fight Archive, which is a database of the largest of its kind in the world where we have close to 4,500 fighter profiles on there for you to browse through and research for seven uh, for uh, fights coming up in 17 different promotions from all over the world. There's direct links to past fights for all these fighters, so it makes it a lot easier. It's your one-stop shop if you're studying for MMA uh, fights, whether you're a predictor, analyst, um, uh, coach, fighter, uh, commentator as well. Uh, we have everything you need on the MMA Fight Archive. Check out the link in the description below. There's a seven-day free trial for you to try it out for free as well. Um, also, just a quick plug for the MMA LOTN PA Patreon page, which is where I drop written breakdowns and a bunch of other great stuff uh, pertaining to a lot of the UFC cards, but also we cover some of the regional events as well. This week alone, on top of uh, Contender Series, which goes down on Tuesday, we also have LFA 194 on Friday. We have KSW 99 and PFL Super Fights, which is the Nganu and Fajera card, also going down on Saturday. And then obviously the Anthony Hernandez and Michelle Pereira UFC Apex card going down uh, Saturday night. So I'll have breakdowns for all of those in written form on the Lock of the Night Patreon page. So if you want some extra action, that is the best way to do it. Uh, check it out in the link in the description below. Uh, it is Thanksgiving up here north of the border in Canada, so I do want to give a quick shout out to my Canadians out there. Cheers. Happy Thanksgiving. Your boy's getting a little bit lit today. I'm not uh, intending on doing any sort of uh, work other than recording this breakdown for you guys. I was just waiting for the weigh-ins to complete, the stare-downs to complete. Then I was going to do this uh, breakdown, drop it to you guys, and then just spend the rest of the day with the family and then get back to work on the UFC card tomorrow. So again, appreciate the love and support and showing you guys the dedication in terms of uh, recording this on a uh, family holiday pretty much to, to uh, break down these fights for you guys. So at the bare minimum, drop a like, drop a subscribe if you haven't already on the YouTube page, and drop a comment below in terms of if you agree or disagree with any of the picks that I have for you guys here for this week's Contender Series card. All right, without further ado, let's get right into this bad boy. Five fights that we got for this card, a um, handful of very intriguing ones, a couple dogs that I'm liking as well, so let's see if we can continue the trend there and cash the very few dogs that I've been able to cash throughout the Contender Series this season. So let's kick it off. First fight of the night. Muhammad Adol coming in at plus 120. Going up against Jonathan McAuliffe coming in at minus 150. Now I'll start off on the Adol side who I was actually in attendance for his pro debut back in December of 2022. And he has been very active as of late. Putting together a 5-0 record since December 2022. Uh, and finishing I believe pretty much every single one of his opponents. Uh, originally coming from a kickboxing and Muay Thai background. We've been seeing a lot of grappling from him as of late and we've seen some good reversals some good submissions some good get-ups a good defensive grappling specifically in his last fight when he seemed to be going up against a judo specialist who did a great job in terms of throwing uh throwing Addo around and landing some takedowns and trips and throws uh but Addo stayed very patient found his reversals found his submission attempt eventually and then got the tap in all in the first round um his striking very solid good work in the clinch with the knees and elbows does a good job in terms of utilizing straight punches down the pipe uh, but I've been very impressed with his grapple heavy approach, especially coming from a kickboxing background. So there's a lot of promise for this Canadian fighter, which 
Usually there's not usually of I believe in this season alone uh, all the Canadian fighters have lost as well so hopefully Ottawa is the last uh, savior for us Canadians in terms of having some success on this season of the contender series. He goes up against an Australian fighter here and Jonathan McAuliffe who has um was actually the a former Hex Fighting Championship uh, uh, welterweight champion, uh, but he ended up losing that title back in March. Uh, he did bounce back uh, earlier th- or later this year uh, with a first round submission. Actually, that was back in September. Uh, this is a big physical guy. You know, he's almost chiseled out of marble considering how jacked this dude is, but. Um, you know, does a good job in terms of utilizing that physicality and strength in terms of walking his opponents down, clinching up with them, pushing them up against the cage, and looking to drag them to the ground. Uh, in terms of his striking, it's a lot of just big shots, uh, no real method to his madness there, um, looking to hurt his opponents. He has some decent power in his shots, but it's clear that fighters that are able to pr- pressure him, stop his grapple-heavy approach, and actually have the better striking will be able to get the better of him, just as we saw in that lone defeat in his professional, uh, that lone professional loss that he had has from back in March uh, a lot of his physicality allows him to get out of bad positions and it gives me a little pause here in terms of the Muhammad Addo side uh, I've seen good enough defensive grappling from Addo and some good submissions as well to make me believe that he should be able to at least handle some of that grapple heavy approach from McAuliffe um, McAuliffe's strength of physicality is a question mark for a here as he does have a little bit of a size on Addo not a whole lot but you can clearly tell that there's a bit of a size advantage there from McAuliffe but if Addo can keep this in the striking realm and nullify the grapple heavy approach of uh, McAuliffe he can do a good enough job in terms of starting to walk him down landing the better shots maybe getting some grapple heavy approach uh, or at least some grappling success of his own but I think he'll struggle in that attempt and I think getting into the grappling could potentially cause him some issues here uh, and potentially allow McAuliffe to uh, take advantage of those spots so I'm hoping that we see Addo use his grappling defensively here utilize an aggressive striking approach which is actually the foundation of his martial arts training uh, and if he can put that pressure on McAuliffe I think he can do a good enough job in terms of getting the momentum of this fight, dictating the pace, and eventually finding a finish in the second or third round. So I'm liking this dog to kick off the card here in uh, Mohamed Addo uh, again. Not super confident, but uh, mainly due to the uh, physicality of McAuliffe. But I do think that we've seen enough, uh, you know, uh, resistance. We've seen Addo do a good job in terms of not settling for bad positions. And his cardio looks great. And his ability to just continue to push forward, put on a pressure uh, and pace that not a lot of opponents are able to deal with. I think that will allow Addo to go out there and win this fight and possibly find that finish later on in this matchup. All right, next up, women's strawweight matchup here as we have Julieta Martinez coming in at minus 135 going up against Leslie Hernandez who comes in at plus 105. Now, we'll start off with the Argentinian fighter who has a flawless 7-0 record, but nothing as flawless as the nickname she has coming into this fight called the Ninja Ferret. Uh, she's very athletic. She loves to do gymnastics, it seems, uh, and she utilizes that physicality of hers and athleticism to overwhelm her opponents in the grappling, looking to take them to the ground and finding some good finishes from that top position her striking is a lot more flashy than anything but she doesn't you know have too much pop on her shots she did have a nasty high kick ko on her amateur record but in terms of the 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 professional scene you know it's a lot harder for her to come by those one punch or one strike knockouts that we saw on the amateur scene uh i do have some question marks about her strength of schedule on the regional scene as we know that you know usually outside of brazil there's a uh, a weaker regional scene especially with these fighters trying to build up and get to the next level uh some fighters are able to break through and actually get to the ufc and have some success um a fighter that i feel like has a lot of potential that just recently got signed from argentina is kevin vallejos who had a tremendous knockout victory uh over a cam teague i believe it was uh but martinez again i i haven't been the most impressed with her ability to control her opponents on the mat against the level that she's been doing it against and i think she'll run into some trouble once she starts facing some resistance which i think she's going to face this weekend in Leslie Hernandez. Now, Hernandez is an MMA lab product trading alongside the likes of Benson Henderson, Bryce Meredith, uh, Sean O'Malley jumps in every now and then. Um, great training partners, great coaching staff as well. Uh, she lost her first professional fight by split decision, but has rattled off four straight victories in a row now, um, most recently getting a solid win over Jade Durand, uh, who you know I think could pretty much beat everybody that Martinez has faced on the Argentinian regional scene. So, 
for that, I, I have to give Leslie Hernandez the, the benefit of the doubt in terms of having the stronger strength of schedule. Uh, but again, both these women, you know, we, we know that women's divisions on the regional scene are quite weak and they don't really face resistance until they get to this level or to the UFC. And that could be the case for both of these women coming into this matchup. I do think Hernandez is the better striker here, at least a little bit more effective, being able to land a little bit more combinations, dictate the pace with her footwork and her uh, and her pace. Um, from a grappling perspective, I could give the slight edge to Martinez, but we have seen some solid improvements from Hernandez in terms of not completely settling on her back and doing a good job in terms of creating scrambles and get up opportunities for herself where she can get back to work with her striking or even utilize an offensive grappling game in her own way. And I think that could come to fruition here for her, especially from what I've been seeing with Martinez getting taken down and controlled herself. Uh, she's managed to pull off some solid victories of her own, doing a good job in terms of... Uh, you know, uh, working out of those bad positions against lower levels of competition and then getting back to work with her own physicality. But I think she'll end up struggling doing that here against Hernandez, who, again, I think she's going to be perfectly trained for this matchup. I think she'll be perfectly prepared as well. And I think the 7-0 record of Martinez needs to be taken with a grain of salt considering the level of competition she was going up against. Again, she did beat a woman that was 7-0, but she, like, steamrolled through her and when you look through that woman's record she's been facing a lot of uh, lower level sketchy competition as well so we can take the 7-0 and record um you know to with too much conviction here um looking into a little bit more uh, it could be a little bit sketchier than that so i'm gonna go with hernandez here seems like she's been taking some love over the last 12 hours or so uh i believe she's roughly around plus 125 yesterday now she's at plus 105 at the time of this recording um so yeah a little bit of love coming in on hernandez and i do agree with that and i think she wins this fight by decision all right, next up, Antonio Mantero coming in at minus 125, going up against Yadier Delval coming in at minus 105. Now, this is a great matchup. We'll start off on the Mantero side of things, who's 17 4 and 1, training out of Novo Uniao, coming up alongside the likes of Jose Aldo and the rest of those great guys over there at Novo Uniao, Jafal Filio, another one to name for you guys. Uh, he's riding a six fight winning streak leading into this contender series opportunity. Uh, he's a BJJ black belt and seems to utilize that approach very effectively in a lot of of his fights uh very aggressive with his jujitsu off of his back and from that top position and he also does a good job in terms of controlling the striking rom utilizing combinations fast strikes and uh, utilizing his agility to get to the target pretty quick um you know, we've seen him challenge and put into some bad spots in past fights, but he's done a good job in terms of uh, working out of those spots. He's also been a little bit over eager with looking for submissions and giving up some uh, dominant positions to chase those submissions, which have put him in bad spots as well. But he doesn't settle for long in those bad spots. He often works back to his feet or finds another submission attempt as well. Um, you know, very uh, explosive, has a, a good a chunk of power and seems to have some very good cards cardio as well uh as a part of this weekend del val is a bjj black belt with a 7-0 record mainly coming up with the fury fc team uh you know he's he loves the guillotine especially in his last two fights uh two fights ago he was able to pull it off in about a minute and then in his next fight he started jumping for guillotine a little bit too much and it ended up costing him as he was being put in bad positions often being grinded out uh from that top position but then when he's able to get back to his feet he's able to get the scores back into his favor because he He's able to land some big shots and start walking his opponents down. Uh, his striking, you know, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of the the process, right? A lot of it is just big winging shots, and it's able to, you know, it's paid off for him in the past, you know, where he's able to uh, kind of outdo some of the work his opponents have done prior in the round, and he's able to get the judges to be back in his favor because of some of the big shots he's able to land. Most. Uh, you know, the one that comes to mind the most is his fight against uh, uh, contender series vet uh, Michael Aswell, uh, who mainly utilizes a very basic striking approach, utilizing his one twos down the middle and breaking his opponents with pace. Uh, you know, the second round of that matchup, I thought Aswell was running about three and a half to four minutes of it until Delval uh, started landing some big shots of his own, got a barrage off, and it seemed that it swayed at least a few of the judges back in his favor for that second round. I thought Aswell won the second or uh, third round. Uh, as he was able to shut down Delval's game, not to mention Delval was starting to slow down as 
well. Uh, Dalvel loves the uh, grappling game. I'm not impressed with his wrestling game all that much, and I think that he uh, mainly looks to knock opponents down or try to jump on their backs to try to get his BJJ going. Uh, but, you know, he's often on his back foot. He's often getting walked down, and the only thing that really saves him is if he's able to knock his opponents down or land big shots, which, again, not really a winning recipe, especially as he starts taking steps up in competition and fighting at higher levels. Now, in this matchup with Montero, I do think we'll see Montero do a good job in, term, in terms of dictating the pace. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Montero look to take this fight to the ground and uh, he might kind of goat uh, Del Val into, uh, you know, uh, attempting a guillotine so that uh, Del Val falls back, uh, falls to his back, allowing Montero to kind of ride out that top position. Um, but I do think that we'll see Montero way more aggressive, controlling the pace, uh, controlling the cage, uh, walking Del Val down and hopefully doing a good enough job in terms of rolling with some of the big shots that are coming back his way from Del Val and then returning with some big counters of his own, possibly even hurting uh, Del Val in this matchup. So I think Del Val is tough to put away, a very tough opponent, both sides as well. Montero, very difficult to put away. But I do think we'll see Montero control the majority of this matchup. And I think he'll start walking Del Val down. And I think he ends up winning this fight on the scorecard. So minus 125, not a bad line there. Uh, again, I think this was uh, Pickham yesterday at minus 110. Seems like a little bit of action coming in on Montero now. All right. Probably the fight that I'm most excited about in this entire card. We got Luis Garul coming in at minus 110, going up against Nick Piccinini coming in at minus 110 as well. Now we'll start off on the Garul side, who is the newly minted Fury FC flyweight champion, which he was able to capture uh, not too long ago. I think it was uh, end of September. He was able to defeat uh, veteran Jacob Silva, who actually competed on the Contender Series a couple years ago. Uh, but Garul, uh, undefeated record, and I love this guy's style you know he has a slow burn of a style in terms of the way he just pressures his opponents with his footwork and then starts getting off on big strikes and looking for opportunities to explode into a barrage of shots and then rinse and repeating that um we haven't seen a whole lot of tape on him getting grappled, but the spots that we do, we see him very urgent in terms of working right back to his feet or doing a good enough job in terms of sta stopping the takedowns right from the jump. Um, you know, we've seen him uh, roll out of bad spots. We've seen him just uh, quickly look to get back to his feet. And then from there, it seems like it demoralizes opponents in terms of not shooting more takedowns, which allows him to end up controlling the pace of the matchups and then start walking them down, breaking them, and possibly even finishing them later on in their matchups. Uh, I I love everything about this Factory X product style just because of that that footwork. He just demands the respect of his opponents, which also often makes them start moving backwards. And then he's able to dictate the pace, uh, find the range that he needs, find the angles that he needs to cut to get into the pocket and start landing some big shots of his own. He's going up against another Fury FC product and Nick Piccinini, who uh, went to a split decision against Jack Duffy back in week three, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, that was a very close fight that apparently Dana did not agree with the judges and they had actually scheduled to have them rematch Jack Duffy and Piccinini on this card but unfortunately Duffy was forced out of the matchup due to an injury and Piccinini accepts a tougher opponent in my opinion now Piccinini was a minus 400 favorite going into that fight against Jack Duffy but the unorthodox approach to mixed martial arts from Duffy caused Piccinini a lot of problems Piccinini was able to land some takedowns and get some decent control time which ultimately led to him winning the fight but there was a lot of uh, weird and unorthodox movements from the BJJ realm and the striking realm from Duffy that caused Piccinini a lot of trouble. Piccinini, his striking is slowly coming along, but I think that he really needs to lean on his wrestling to have success in his matchups which is where he's able to dominate his opponents from that top position and actually end up uh, um, finding submission victories as well. Uh, he's 7-0 and with five of those coming by submission, often looking for that arm triangle choke position where he's very strong in terms of applying the pressure putting his opponents out or forcing them to tap. Uh, he's a Fortis MMA product that originally started his career with AKA, has a tremendous wrestling background. I think two-time All-American, three-time Pac-10 winner. I believe that's what it was. Again, Canadian, not completely familiar with the collegiate wrestling uh, things down there, but I know he's an All-American at least twice, and he's won a couple national titles as well, so uh, a very, very strong wrestler, uh, very uh, credentialed on the college scene, and it's obviously worked out very well for him uh, through his seven mixed martial arts fight as well. Um, here against Gruel, even though this is a short order spot for Gruel, he hasn't been out of action for that long. He just had his last fight 
at the ending of September. And this is a guy that seems to stay in shape year round. Uh, and I think his pace and his pressure is going to cause a lot of trouble for Piccinini. I do not doubt that Piccinini will be able to land a couple of takedowns here, but I don't think that we'll see Garou settle here, allowing him to eventually work back to his feet and nullify the amount of damage that Piccinini is able to get from that top position. From there, look for Garou to get the respect of Piccinini in the striking realm and start walking him down and landing big shots of his own, which could potentially lead to a third round finish. I'd probably say round three or decision for Garul in this spot but I think his damage based approach with his aggressiveness and ability to control the tempo of the cage and the fight I think is going to cause Piccinini a lot of trouble which will eventually lead to Garul getting his hand raised in the spot at pick him odds again it's tough to bet against a guy that has the type of wrestling that Piccinini does but from what I've been seeing from Garul and his ability to work out of bad spots when getting wrestled I think it's going to cause Piccinini a lot of trouble and hopefully the judges continue to stick with the guys that end up landing more damage and that should end up being Garul in the spot. And I wouldn't be surprised, like I said, either he gets that third round stoppage, which I might take a little bit of a bite on depending on what those odds are. Uh, but I do end up thinking he wins this fight by decision. All right. Main event and the last fight for season eight of the Contender Series. And it goes down between short notice replacement Nick Klein, who comes in at plus 145, going up against Geraldo Souza, who comes in at minus 175. Klein comes in with a 5 and 1 record and gets a short, a short notice opportunity. Uh, but his last win did come over a fighter that was a 22 and 21 uh, with a 22 and 21 record. Uh, and he was unable to submit him in less than a minute in their matchup. Uh, prior to that he had a win over a former contender series con uh, contestant and Colin Huckbody uh, and then prior to that he actually lost to a fighter up here in Canada uh, in a fight that he was unable to apply his uh, style ended up getting grinded out himself and then finished in the third round of that matchup Klein is a guy that trains out of Pura Vida which is out of Wisconsin head uh, head coach by former UFC fighter Zach Otto um, also a training partner of Wes Schultz who I believe was actually supposed to fight Geraldo Souza in the spot but Schultz pulled out um, but Klein is a guy that likes to utilize a lot of pressure a lot of physicality looking to rough his opponents up in the clinch take them to the ground and just break them with pace and pressure pace and pressure I should say but he's also had issues in terms of dealing with guys that try to do, do that to him as well uh, he hasn't competed in close to a year so I'm kind of surprised that he's been able to take this spot and actually make weight uh, who knows how prepared he'll actually be for this matchup uh, I think the main reason he got this call up was because of the fact that he knew that his teammate was Schultz was not going to be able to make the the date so he was able to throw his name into the hat and get the call um, but again not super impressed with him lack uh you know his biggest win over Colin Huckbody that was a fight where he was able to get off on his game but when he can't get off on his game is when he starts to struggle and I think he'll struggle here against the BJJ black belt uh Geraldo Souza who does a great job in terms of putting pressure uh on his opponents himself uh he trades alongside the guys like Bruno Ferreira and Brandison Habero has some solid shots in his punches um and we've seen him very aggressive with the grappa heavy approach in the uh, in the past uh he doesn't accept bad positions for long and and even though his body language does not look the greatest in the latter half of fights, he does a great job in terms of fighting that next gear and looking to walk his opponents down and turn the tide of fights and get back uh, to, to having success of his own. He's an interesting prospect, but I still have some question marks in terms of what his ceiling is. Uh, his lone defeat came to uh, last week's uh, Contender Series contestant Vanilto Antunes, who was able to knock him out in just over a minute, which is usually Antunes' calling card. And I wonder how that fight would have gone had it gone a little bit longer. Uh, I do like Souza here, but I'm not a big fan of the minus 175 line. I do think that we'll see this be somewhat competitive, and it really comes down to who can dictate the pace, especially in the clinch and the grappling realm. And Klein could have some success. The guy's a big, uh, strong guy, but I believe the lack of preparation that he had for this matchup compared to Souza, who's been training for, you know, this is going to be his third different opponent that he's been getting ready for this date. Um, I think he's more prepared. I think he'll have the better gas tank, and I think he'll be able to deal with that early climb pressure, or yeah, the early climb pressure, and then reverse the the fortune there and actually get some success of his own in the clinch and the grappling and eventually finding his submission on the ground, probably in the second or third round. There you guys go. I'm going to miss doing the contender series for you guys. But a reminder, I cover so many promotions. So if you're looking for not just UFC breakdowns, I do Bellator, PFL, LFA, Cage Warriors, ACA, KSW, and Octagon, all which have usually an event every single week in terms of you know on top of the ufc there's usually one of these promotions having an event maybe multiple promotions as well uh so 
If you're looking for more breakdowns, I'll either be dropping bonus episodes on the the YouTube page, which I only do once a month. Otherwise, I break them down, all of them, on in written form on the MMA LOT and Patreon page. So I've been, if I've been helping you make money through the Contender Series this season, the best way to show your gratitude would be through the MMA LOT and Patreon page, where you'll be able to get a ton of other breakdowns. But the bare minimum I ask is hit a, hit that like. And hit that subscribe on the YouTube channel. I just surpassed 8,000 subscribers. Hoping to get to that 10,000 mark sooner than later. Um, yeah, would be great if you guys could help me get there. Hopefully we can end this uh, Contender Series season with a bang, uh, with a big event here. We'll see how that goes. Appreciate the love. Appreciate the support. I'll see you guys Tuesday evening for the uh, uh, lo- MMA Lawcast episode for the next UFC card as well. I'll also have PFL breakdowns later on this week. Appreciate the love. Appreciate the support. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Peace.